Yesterday we covered gentleness in speech and being a kind person, being a soft person. And today one of the manifestations of being kind and being soft is being humble. And it's also one of the causes which enables us to become gentle and to become soft. So today we'll be speaking about bringing humility into our lives. The benefits of humility and obviously the harms of being arrogant or being proud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us first and foremost in the Quran. Allah says, وَلَا تُسَعِرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا وَلَا تُسَعِرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ Don't turn your face away from people. Don't turn your nose up at them. وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا And don't walk on the, on the ground, on the earth with pride. In another hadith, the Muslim actually says something quite amazing. He makes a really great observation. And we can, this can relate to us today. The people who own sheep and goats, he said, are the people of humility. And the people who own camels are people who generally have pride inside them. Now for us, this doesn't make much sense. How can a person who owns a camel, what's the difference between him and a person who owns a sheep or a goat? Now the way I can explain this to you is, imagine somebody who owns a 1990s micro and somebody owns a 2018 plate Audi, right? If somebody was going to have pride of the two, who do you think would have the pride? The person who's got the newest car, the person who has something to be proud about. The person who's going around in his dad's 1990s micro, which can barely get to the end of the road. This guy's got nothing to be proud about, right? So there's humility, there's more of a chance of being this person. So Nabi Sassam was telling us from this hadith, that what you own also affects your heart. What you own also affects your heart. Because if you own something which isn't, you know, you've got nothing to be proud about, then naturally it'll be easier for you to be humble. And then if a person who's got nothing to shout about then acts proud, and this is a worse type of pride, that you've got nothing to be proud about, and then you're showing pride. There was something happened yesterday with a friend of mine. Somebody turned up at his house asking for collection for money. Okay. So he comes to the door. My friends are at home. His wife was there. So his wife must have given 10 pounds. And 10 pounds isn't like a meager amount. It's not like you're not giving a couple of pounds or a few pennies. You're giving 10 pounds, right? So she gives 10 pounds, not knowing you know, what the status quo is. She gives 10 pounds and he said, no, it's okay. I'll speak to your husband later. And he sends it back. You think you've gone to her house to collect money. You've gone in a position of humility. And then you're showing pride by rejecting that sum of money and saying, no, actually, I'll come back for, I'll come back for more later. This is the worst type of pride. That I've come to ask from you and then you give me something and I'm like, no, sorry, I'm, I'm too dignified for this. On one occasion, somebody comes to Hakim al-Ummah Hanwi, rahmatullahi alayhi, and he came with a box of mitai. But he didn't carry the box himself. He had somebody, somebody junior, that, who, was, you know, who was younger than him or more junior than him, who was carrying the box on his behalf. And so this person comes and presents the gift to Hakim al-Ummah, rahmatullahi alayhi. Hakim al-Ummah gauges from within this person that this man has pride inside him because he's not carrying the box himself, which means he thinks he's beyond that. He thinks he's better than that. And the person comes and says, I want you to take bayah at your hands, you know, I want you to help me rectify, you get rectified and connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hakim al-Ummah says, okay, let's, let's, take this, let's take this illness out of him. So he goes, okay, I've, I've got a program in another place right now, so we don't have time. So join me on the train, and when we get to that place, then, you know, you can take the, the oath, the Pledge of Allegiance. So the person says, okay, and he joins him on the train. And then he, they get to the place where he has to go, and he says, oh, sorry, we're short of time here as well. Then he said, join me on my journey, we'll carry on. And we'll go to the next place, and I'll, you know, we'll do the bay'ah then. And he takes him to two or three places, and this person is vexing, he's getting really angry inside. So I came for bay'ah, and he's taking me to three, two, three places, why can't he just, you know... Take my hand and make me say the words now. And by the end of it, after seeing him vexed, Hakim al finally gives him bay'ah. And Hakim al then tells him that, look, this is the reason why. And he explained it to him. And the ulama commenting on this said it took a couple of hours to rid this person of his disease, of, you know, pride, of arrogance. Another person comes to Hakim al majlis and he is sounded like from the way he was speaking that, you know, he was, he was a proud man. So Hakim al says, okay, you've come here to get rectified. He says, yeah, I'll do anything, rectify me. He says, okay, inshallah, let's do it. He says, stand at the entrance of the masjid. 
stand at the entrance of the masjid and whoever comes in, young or old, you have to take their sandals. They can't put on the sh- shoe shelves. You have to take their sandals off the ground and you have to put it on the shelves yourself. And the person was an alim. And within a few days, this person was, his pride was rectified. Why? Because he realized that when you, when a three-year-old comes in and one shoe is there, another shoe is there, you have to put it together as an alim and you have to put it on the shoe shelf properly. Naturally, it's going to create humility inside you. People like Shaykh al-Arab al-Ajjam, Hazrat Mullah Hussain al-Mandi, rahmatullahi alayhi. Oh, student. His teacher, Shaykh al-Hind, was called Shaykh al-Alam. When they spent the years together in Malta, I'll just say something on the side whilst I'm mentioning them. Mullah Hussain Ahmed Madani wasn't a hafiz. But his teacher had a sunnah, or he had a habit, of finishing the Qur'an like we do in Taraweeh every year. But the student, nor the shaykh, is a hafiz. You've got a problem. And they're both together in prison. So the student, in, this, in dedication to his teacher, learnt a para, a juz of the Qur'an a day to lead him in Taraweeh. He was in the, and when they were in the madrasa together, they used to see, they used to find that everywhere, um, every toilet in the madrasa would be clean. But nobody, there wasn't an appointed cleaner. And he was the Shaykh al Hadith at the time. He was teaching Sahih al Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, the greatest books of Hadith. And people were wondering and they were thinking, who is doing this? Who is doing this? And one day, he wakes, one of the students wakes up and one of the students goes to see who is it. And he sees his teacher. Shaykh al-Arab al-Ajab, the one who used to give dars for 17 years in front of the rawdha of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, cleaning the toilets. This is, this is humility. This is, I told the story before, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, I'm going to visit the old women in the night and cleaning the houses for them and cooking for them. This is humility. When Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala heard about a woman, he, he walked past her house and the woman was crying and the children were crying and she was reciting couplets saying that, you know, because of Sayyidina Umar, because some new welfare system he had brought in, because of that life has become difficult for us. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala himself goes back to the Baytul Mal in Medina. And he goes and he carries a sack of food. His, his helper, Aslam, his servant Aslam is there with him. And Aslam says, you know what, you know what? Amir al-Mu'mineen, give me the bag of food, I'll carry it. And then Umar radiallahu replies that, no, I was the one who, you know, who caused discomfort to this woman, I will be the one who brings comfort back to her. And he carries it himself and he brings it to her. This is humility. People like you and I, maybe you have something to be proud about. People like me, we have nothing, nothing to be proud about. And we walk around like, you know, we own the world. We walk around with our parents and with our elders, even people older than us. And we try to equate ourselves with them and we try to, you know, try to show who we are. Muhallab once walked past Malik bin Dinar, rahmatullahi alayhi, the great Malik. And Ismail narrates his story. And I've told you this story before. So Muhallab walks past. And Malik bin Dinar, rahmatullahi alayhi, just sat there and, you know, they must have done salam. But he didn't change the way he was for him. He didn't stand up for him. He didn't show him any extra respect. So Muhallab became offended. Muhallab said, don't you know who I am? You don't know who I am? That you couldn't get up and give me special treatment? And Malik bin Dinah replied. He said, oh, I know exactly who you are. When you were born and you were created from a dirty clot, when Allah gave you life, you carry filth inside your stomach and when you die, you'll become a body which will decompose. I know exactly who you are. And Muhallab replies, Al-an, al-an, araftuni. Today I have recognized myself. Today I know who exactly who I am. So Allah loves the humble people. Allah loves the one who gives in. Even in salah. Even in salah. When we stand for salah. When we stand in salah. What is the command when we pray in jama'at behind the imam? We straighten the safs. Do you know why this is? One of the wisdoms of this. Who can think of a very easy, simple wisdom? A man with pride will want to stand naturally ahead of a person who thinks is inferior to him. If I am a teacher and my student is next to me, to show my superiority, I want to stand in front of him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, step back, stand next to him. Slave and master stand next to each other. When we go for hajj, what happens in hajj? Everybody, rich or poor, young or old, Arab or Ajab or non-Arab, they all 
wear the same clothes. Why? Because when you stand in front of Allah, you are all the exact same. It's to make you humble, it's to make you and I humble. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, who are the, How special are the humble people? Allah says, The ibad of Ar Rahman, the true slaves and servants of Ar Rahman. I just remembered something. It's a bit off topic, but it comes from the word ibad, which means to worship. Just, I was reading in a book today, Tafsir Al Tahrir wa Tanweer. Ibn Ashur rahmatullahi writes something really beautiful. Ibn Ashur was a great mufassir, a great commentator of the Quran. And he wrote something under the ayat, Iyaka na'amudu wa Iyaka nasta'in, where we tell Allah we only worship you, we are only your slaves. He said in Arabic there are two words which sound very similar and come from the same origins. One word is ibadah, ibadah meaning worship, and the other word meaning ubudiyah. Ubudiyah means to be a slave, servitude. Two words, ibadah, ubudiyah, very similar, worship and servitude. He says people equate these, but they're not the same. Ibadah is a person does whatever makes Allah happy. When I worship, I do whatever makes Allah happy, whatever pleases Allah. And ubudiyah is you are pleased and you are happy with whatever Allah does. You have to understand, this is deep. You have to really understand this. Ibadah is al-abd yaf'alu ma yarda rabb The servant and the slave does whatever makes Allah happy. And ubudiyah is you are happy with whatever Allah does. Meaning if Allah gives you good times or bad times, you are happy with Allah. This is being a slave. This is servitude. Allah says, who are my true slaves? Al-ladheena yamshuna ala al-ardi hawna. The people who walk on the ground, on the earth, and they walk in a very soft and gentle way. Humility is, like we said yesterday, when you have gentleness in speech, people are attracted to you. People are attracted to humble people. I'll give you a simple example. You can all appreciate this, okay? Especially if you like football. One of the most hated managers in football is Jose Mourinho. And you know why? You know why? It's because he's arrogant. <laughs> He's arrogant, right? He thinks he can go around calling himself the special one. So he's arrogant and he's hated. Okay? And you get other people who are more humble. And when you're more humble, people take... A, this is just a you know, really easy example for us to understand. But when you are humble, people take a liking to you. So we have many, many examples of Rasulullah wasallam and his humility. On one occasion, Nabi wasallam. He was praying salah in Mecca. And the Quraysh came to attack Rasulullah sallallahu in his salah. On one occasion, they tried to suffocate and strangle him. Nabi sallallahu doesn't react. Or another occasion, he goes into sajda and the Quraysh come and, the, and Abu Jahl himself comes and he takes the entrails, the intestines of an animal, a camel probably, and he takes and he puts it on the back of Rasulullah sallallahu to disgrace him. As if he said, you're in sajda, keep your head down now. And his daughter Sayyidina Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha sees this. And she's crying and she goes and takes it from her father's back. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gets up and he doesn't make a bad dua against Abu Jahl. He doesn't make a bad dua against the Quraysh. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shows his true character and he shows his humility. And it's because of this humility that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was accepted to such an extent. I give an example, right? Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala and he once heard that Abu Jahl had said a few bad things about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hamza at that time wasn't a Muslim. Hamza wasn't a Muslim. Hamza was coming back from archery, from hunting, and he comes and sees Abu Jahl. He says, Abu Jahl, you said something to my nephew? So even though he wasn't a Muslim, he had this, like, his, this pride, that, you know, this, rather than pride, this protective nature, ghayra, for his nephew, that how dare you say something to my nephew? He goes, and he says to Abu Jahl, he goes, who do you think you are? You said something to my nephew. And Abu Jahl said, oh, somebody's sensitive. Have you accepted his message as well? At that moment, Hamza's iman wasn't set in stone. But Hamza said, yes, I have accepted his message. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? You know, how are you going to react now? Abu Jahl knows you can't touch Hamza, right? You get beaten up. <laughs> right, take a step back. And Abu Jahl lets Hamza go. So on one side, Nabi Sassam shows his humility. On the other side, his humility. Because he doesn't, he doesn't react. His uncle reacts instead and his uncle accepts Islam through the barakah of Nabi Sassam's humility. 
on one occasion, Mullah Mu'inuddin Ajmani rahmatullahi goes to visit Shaykh al-Hind. And he doesn't know what he looks like. He doesn't know what he looks like. So he goes to his house. I mentioned this story last year as well, I remember. He turned up at his house. And there's a man there wearing a vest and wearing lungi. Right? Wearing a vest, wearing a lungi. And he goes, I've come to see, you know, Shaykh al-Hind, Mullah Mahmud al-Hassan, rahmatullahi alayhi. So the person said, okay, you know, it's hot. Let me, let me get something for you. Let me bring something for you to eat, to drink. Let me bring some snacks for you. And he says, okay. So the man in the vest and the lungi, he's come to his house. So he comes and he goes and gets him some food. And then he says, oh, you know what? I just came here to meet him. So if you can call him, he goes, oh, you might be quite, you know, we might be quite warm. So he gets a fan and he starts to fan him as well. <laughs> he starts to fan him, gets him food and drink, looks after him properly. And now Mullah Mu'inuddin becomes quite, you know, quite agitated now. He says, you know, I, I came here for, with a short time just to meet this, just to meet, you know, Shaykh al-Hind and I want to be on my way. And the man wearing the vest and the lungi replies, there's no Shaykh al-Hindi. I am Mahmoud al-Hassan and this is my humble abode. I am Mahmoud al-Hassan and this is my house. And he turns back to him and he says, what? The man who is called Shaykh al-Hind, Shaykh al-Hind meaning the Shaykh of Hind. And if you have read, you know, um, the history of the British Empire within India and the East India Company and in, in the 1800s and 1900s and how the people, how the Muslims and the ulama stood up and how they suffered at the hands of um, the British then. You'll, you'll understand exactly why he was called Shaykh al-Hind. <coughs> and his humility was said that he's serving his, he's serving his guest and the guest doesn't even know this man is a great Shaykh al-Hind. And this, is what it was, this was a trademark of our ulama. It was a trademark, simplicity and humility. And because they were so humble, people took a liking to them. Because they were so humble and they were so beautiful in character that people were attracted to them, people were attached to them. So humility is a trait that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses a person with love when a person is humble. In a really, really stark hadith, Nabi Sassam tells us, that لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من كبر. A person who has even an atom's weight of pride in his heart will not enter Jannah. Not even an atom's weight of pride. If you have this, you will not enter Jannah. The Sahaba, really quite, you know, taken aback by this, awakened by this, were like, what? But Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, some of us we like. New clothes, we like new shoes, we like to look nice. Does this come under pride? Because then we can't have nice clothes, then we won't go to Jannah. Nabi Sassim says, No, no, inna Allah jameelun yuhibbul jalal. Allah is beautiful and loves everything of beauty. Allah loves things of beauty. What is pride? Pride is, or lack of humility is. That somebody tells you the truth and you dismiss it. nas, And you think somebody, you are better than other people. You have a superiority complex. And you think you are better than people. When you can't accept criticism, number one. You can't accept criticism. And you think you are better than people, understand you are a man of pride. According to Rasulullah So we can all see this inside our lives. If somebody tells me I'm wrong. And rather than apologizing and accepting my mistake, I try to fight him. And I try to, you know, I try to do hujjah. And I try to argue with him. It's a sign that I've got something wrong in there. I, who knows a perfect example? Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam and shaitan. Both did something they shouldn't have. Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam should not have eaten from the tree. Shaitan tricked him and confused him. And Adam alayhi salam then ate from the tree. Shaitan was asked to do sajda, correct? Did shaitan do sajda? Shaitan rejected. How did Adam react? How did shaitan react? Adam alayhi salam understood the mistake he made. Adam fatalaqa Adam min rabbihi kalimatin fataba alayhi. Innahu huwa tawabur rahim. Adam alayhi salam said, Rabbana zalamna anfusana. Allah, I've made a mistake. I have made a mistake. If you don't forgive us and you don't have mercy on us, then we're going to be from the lost ones. We're going to be from the losers, oh Allah. 
I've understood my mistake, I've realized my mistake, I apologize, I am sorry, forgive me. Adam alayhi salam went on to become the father of the whole of humanity, all of humankind because of his humility. Shaitan rejected the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rejected the command of Allah. Shaitan was proud and Shaitan became the leader of all the shayateen, of all the evil people until the day of Qiyamah. Look at where humility took Adam and look at where pride took Shaitan. So we are humble people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love us. Allah says, I will count you from my servants if you show humility. In one hadith, Nabi sallallahu says, Man tarak al mira'a wa huwa muhiqun. A person who gives up a fight or an argument, even though what he is saying is correct. I am correct, but you are arguing with me and I give up the argument just to, you know, just to get rid of the fight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises me a place in wasatul jannah, in the best part of jannah, where I can see everything around me. This is what happens when you are humble, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you. People love you, Allah loves you. And there's nothing greater a man wants than for people, for people to love him and respect him and for Allah to love him and respect him. And Allah to then reward him. So this is why it's very important, this quality of humility we bring inside our lives. Some signs that we lack humility, like I said, is we don't accept criticism, even if it's constructive. We always make an effort to stay on top of other people, to show our superiority. We hunt for praise. We hunt for praise. Because we have this ego that needs to be filled. And this ego will only be filled and satisfied if I keep hearing good things about myself. So I'll go and you know push out my own agenda so people praise me. If we can't accept another person's opinion, and we think our opinion is the best, I prefer to be a manager, to be the one who delegates and the one who is delegated, the one who gives commands rather than to the one who is given command to. These are all signs of pride people. And you know what? We can probably spot it inside our lives. That we are proud people and we need to fix this. Because when we have this pride, we become a deterrent for people to like us. We become a deterrent for people to love us. We become harsh people. And this links in with yesterday because then our tongues become difficult as well. We become very sharp. Our tongues become very sharp. And it's very difficult to deal with this. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us His humility. How do we get there? It's quite simple. You get there by practice. You get there by practicing humility. When somebody gives you opinion, you take their opinion. Somebody who you don't think is worthy of an opinion, give him a chance to give an opinion. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh calls all the Sahaba. And he says, give me the tafsir of إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ The Sahaba give their tafsirs. He calls Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas, who was the most junior of all of them. He says, Abdullah bin Abbas, give me your opinion. And the other Sahaba are thinking, we are people who participate in Badr, in Uhud, and you're calling Abdullah bin Abbas, who's a child. You know, they say, Gujadi, Ajkal, Nubachu, right? You're calling him to give an opinion on the Qur'an. And Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh, that he had no qualms, no issue. You are younger than me, so what? You have their ilm and you present their ilm. Then he gave the tafsir of إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ Sayyidina Umar accepted and says, this is why I asked him. This is why I asked him for an opinion. So even those people who you don't think are worthy of opinion, ask them and accept that opinion. Somebody say something, somebody tells you, especially the husbands, right? You, do, you did nothing wrong at home and your wife says, say sorry. And you got to say sorry, man. You got to apologize. Okay, you've got to admit you're wrong. You humble yourself. Especially in a marriage. If in a marriage both of you want to rule the house, it's not going to work. Okay? You rule everything outside the house, that you rule everything inside the house. Be, be humble. Be humble. Put yourself down. Even in salah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi will tell us that if, it's, if people are squashed in salah, Nabi Sallallahu says, give your shoulder in. Meaning, the person next to you, he wants space, you make yourself smaller so he can have space. This all comes from humility. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us his humility, make us from his um, beloved servants, and make us from those who aren't deprived of Jannah, and the people who are saved from the fire of Jannah. Ameen wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi.